We're going to continue our study today of Paul's message to the Ephesian elders. We began last week to look at Paul's message here to these elders, and uh, Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey right now. He's on his way back to Jerusalem um, with the love gift that he has from the saints of Galatia, of Achaia, Corinth, in that area. He has collected his love gift from the Gentiles, and he's taking it to Jerusalem now. <clears throat> and on his way back, his ship lands at Miletus. Uh, Miletus is there on the map. You see Ephesus is just a little bit north of that. So he sends to Ephesus, which was about 25 miles away, and he asks for the elders of the church of Ephesus to come to Miletus and meet with him. Now, <clears throat> 25 miles, that's a full day's journey. For us, it'd be like driving 10 hours, 12 hours. But they had to walk the whole way. But so Paul calls for these elders and obviously very quickly they all get together and come down there. Uh, no questions. Paul asks for them to come. They come. Uh, when they arrive, Paul, as we looked at last week, gives them the first part of the message which kind of deals with his testimony. He encourages them to follow the example that he has set. And now we'll see this morning he's going to give them a prophetic warning. Warning them about the future. One of the significant things about this message is that it's the only time in Luke's writing that Paul gives a message to believers. Every other time Paul's preaching, he's preaching an evangelistic message, trying to get the lost to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. This time he is preaching to a believing body. He's preaching to these elders. And as we saw last week, he calls these elders to follow the pattern of godly conduct that he has set. Now let me just remind you, as we talked about last week, when we talk about elders or overseers or pastors, it is all the same office. They are different Greek words used to deal with the same office. And when you see the word elder, it's always in the plural. Because it's always a plurality of leadership in each church. And I think that's because the Lord knows the propensity of the human heart to abuse power. And so he has designed the leadership of the local church to be multiple, not single. And that kind of checks this tendency for someone to abuse power. It checks the tendency of people to go overboard in certain things because you have a, a group of men, and it is men who lead the church, a group of men leading that church, governing that church, giving it direction. That is the biblical pattern for church leadership. Now Paul turns to warn and exhort these elders. <clears throat> and we'll start this morning with verse 28. That's where we, we ended with 27 last time and proceed down through to 38 here. Paul says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, if you remember last week, Paul basically said, I fulfilled my responsibility. I'm pure from the blood of all men. Well, basically he's saying, now it's your responsibility. I'm leaving. You take heed to yourselves and the flock which belongs to the Lord God. And he starts out by saying, be on guard for yourselves. Now, this could mean elders, you got to police each other. you got to watch out for each other. Or it could just be saying, you elders, take care of yourselves. Watch out for your own life. Make sure that it lines up with what it should be. Be on guard for your heart, for your doctrine, for your behavior. I think probably it means both. You know, the elders were to look out for themselves and their own spiritual life and then look out for the, the welfare of the group and then for the flock. When Paul wrote to Timothy, who, by the way, was an elder in Ephesus, Paul writes this to him in 1 Timothy 4.16. Pay close attention to yourself and your teaching. So before even your teaching, Timothy, watch yourself. Watch your life. Make sure it lines up with what it should be. He says, for as you do these things, you will ensure salvation for both yourself and those who hear you. Guard your life, Timothy. An elder must first and foremost guard his own spiritual life. He can't shepherd the flock of God if he's a spiritual mess. That should make sense to us. Paul guarded his own life with extreme diligence. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.26. He 
He says, therefore, I run in such a way. Now, they had the Isthmian games at Corinth, so he uses these athletic metaphors, which they would understand. He goes, I run in such a way, not without aim. I box in such a way, not beating the air, but I discipline my body. I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So he's, elder, he's calling these elders to take care of themselves because he doesn't want them to be disqualified. And this is the pattern he has set. Now he says here, I discipline my body because he didn't want to be disqualified from ministry. The Greek word here is hupopiazo. And it literally means to punch in the eye, to buffet, to disable an antagonist, to subdue. Paul said, I'm literally punching myself in the eye to bring my body into subjection because I don't want to be disqualified from this ministry. I don't want to do it to myself. So he's using this extreme discipline to keep himself in line. He was an example. He knew that. He called others to follow that example. He told Timothy to follow his example. 1 Timothy 4.2, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. Timothy, you're leading that church in Ephesus. You're one of the elders there. Be an example. So he tells these elders, be on guard for yourself. Watch your own spiritual life because you're an example to the flock. They're not only to guard themselves, but he says, you guard all the flock. Be on guard first of all for yourselves. Make sure your spiritual life's right. And then take care of the flock. And he tells them to shepherd the flock. Now, if you'll notice in this text, there's a lot of sheep symbolism, all right? He talks about the flock, which are the sheep, they're the people in the church, and he talks about the elders being the shepherds, they're literally under shepherds guarding the flock, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, and they're appointed by the Holy Spirit to protect, to feed the sheep. And then he talks about the dangers of the wolves coming in that would destroy the flock. So he's using a metaphor of sheep here. And maybe that's not so good for us because we probably don't know a lot about sheep. You know, maybe the most you know about sheep is you saw one in a petting zoo somewhere, you know, because we just don't have that kind of culture today. But I'll tell you what, it's good to read about sheep. It'd be good for you to do a little research because it's pretty fascinating. They're very dumb. They're defenseless, number one. They're totally defenseless animals. And secondly, they're very dumb. All right? And the shepherd always will lead them. If you see a shepherd leading a flock, the shepherd is out front, and the flock is following behind. There's one time that changes, and that's when it gets dark. And when it gets dark, the flock totally will surround the shepherd and put him in the middle. So they're like, you know, we're afraid, it's night, we need to be really close to you, and they'll just watch, be right around that shepherd. And this is a very familiar metaphor in the Scriptures. In Jeremiah 13, 17, in Zechariah 10.3, God calls Israel the Lord's flock. And in John 10, Jesus is called the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he compares himself to those who are not trying to take care of the flock, but destroy it. And as good under-shepherds, the elders are to guard the flock of God against all dangers. They're to protect their spiritual well-being. Paul says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Now, how are the shepherds to guard the flock? I don't think he's saying you've got to get involved in everybody's life and make sure they're doing this or doing that. I don't think that's the issue at all. I think, first of all, the primary responsibility of the shepherd is to feed the flock. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as far as shepherding and the overall protecting, I think the shepherd's job is to warn of false shepherds that are out there trying to fleece the sheep. Now I want you to notice here that these elders are made elders not by self-election or human ordination, but they are made elders by divine appointment. It says the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Now my question here is, how? How did the Holy Spirit make them overseers? Well, I think that when the apostles were around, they appointed elders. And we know that because we have an il illustration here of when uh, and an apostolic delegate was told to appoint elders. Look at Titus. Titus was appointed by the apostles to go to the Isle of Crete to take care of the church there. He says, for this reason I left you in Crete 
that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I have directed you. So Titus was to go to Crete. He was to appoint elders there. So the apostles or their delegates could appoint elders. Now, that, el that appointment would have been through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit put them there to do that. But once the apostles died off, how are, how are elders appointed by the Holy Spirit today? I mean, you've got a lot of people claiming that title. How do we know who's appointed and who's not? Well, I think there's basically three ways that we know if someone is appointed to the Holy Spirit. And I think they're found here in 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. It says, It is a trustworthy statement. If any man does, aspires to the office of an overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now, this text goes on to list more qualifications, but I think you'll get the point here. I see from this text basically two ways that the Holy Spirit appoints elders. First of all, he plants a desire for the work in the heart. The Greek word here for aspire, oregomai, it means to reach out after, to long for, to covet, to desire. In other words, God places a desire in the heart of a man to, to shepherd the flock of God. And secondly, if he has truly done that, the man fits the qualifications. He says an elder then must be, and then he lists the qualifications. So a man who has a desire to care for the flock and who fits these qualifications, can shepherd the flock of God. And Paul tells these elders that their task is to shepherd the church of God. Now I think that if a man has been called of God to shepherd the church, and if he has these qualifications, that the local church will recognize that and put that man in that position. But I think that man should be functioning in that way before he's ever put into an official capacity. In other words, you just do this because the Holy Spirit's put it in your heart. A shepherd here is the Greek word poimen, and you know what it means? Shepherd. A lot of translations will put feed in here, and feed's a, wholly diff a totally different word. So, you know, the New Americans got it right here. It is shepherd. It means to, to pastor, to watch over that flock. So all the elders do the work of pastoring. Peter tells the elders the same thing in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I exalt the elders, again, it's plural, among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, he tells these elders. You know, it's interesting that Peter here calls himself an elder. He's an apostle, but he says, listen, you elders, I'm an elder too, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Now again, notice he mentions here, don't do it for profit. It's not about money. You're not in there doing this for, to, for money. You do it to take care of the flock of God. Now Peter in this text uses all three of the Greek terms that describe church leaders. They are elder, shepherd, an overseer. We saw the same thing in our text in Acts. Paul uses all three of these terms. They're not distinct from one another. They all are terms that simply are identifying the very same people, church leadership. Let's look at a conversation that Jesus had with Peter. This is a, a post-resurrection. This is in John 21. After Jesus has been crucified and risen from the dead, He's having this conversation with Peter, all right? And so he says, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? You remember the, what happened with Peter when, you know, Peter came out there and he said, though everybody forsakes you, not me, Lord. And the Lord said, you will deny me three times before the cock grows, and he did. He denied him three times. And it's interesting, in this text, three times he says, do you love me? You denied me three times, let me ask you, do you love me three times? And Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these guys love me? I mean, you said you're, you, you know, you're the one that I can count on, you're the one that will never forsake me, so do you love me more than they do? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I like you a lot, basically is what Peter's response is. And he said to him, 
tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I like you a lot, your friend. He said to him, shepherd, my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. Why do you keep asking me the same question? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo you. Not agape, but again, phileo. I like you a lot. And Jesus says to him, tend my sheep. So three times he asked Peter, do you love him? And three times Peter responds, I really like you a lot. Phileo, it's a brotherly kind of love, an affectionate kind of love. He's not using agape here. Agape is the self-sacrificing kind of love that gives. And Peter just didn't make a sacrifice not too soon prior to this. He denied he even knew the Lord. So he's saying, Lord, I, I can't say I agape you, but I, I like you a lot. You know, I have a brotherly affection towards you. In this text, three times Jesus says this. Tend my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. Tend my sheep. The middle time, he uses the word poimeno, which is shepherd. So they got it right. It is shepherd. But the first and the third time, he uses the Greek word bosco, not poimeno. Poimeno means to shepherd. There's more involved in shepherding than just feeding. You do other things. as a, You protect the sheep. You, you shear the sheep. You do different things for the sheep. So shepherding is everything that's involved. But bosco simply means feed. Feed them. Give them something to eat. Tend is not a good translation, so let's change it. Feed my lambs. Shepherd my sheep, feed my lambs. So from what Jesus says to Peter, we see that the primary responsibility of the shepherd is to feed the flock. To teach them the word of God. This is the elder, overseer, pastor's primary responsibility to teach the word of God. That's what Jesus called Peter to do. This is what Paul did. This is what Paul is calling the Ephesian elders to do. Feed the flock of God. In Ezekiel 34, there's a divine rebuke to the shepherds of Israel because they've forsaken their task and their calling as shepherds. And they've begun to feed themselves from the flock rather than feeding the flock. So in Ezekiel 34, 2, he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And again, this idea over and over, this is the shepherd's job, to feed that flock, to take care of them. Now God goes on in this text to rebuke these shepherds of Israel for the fact that the flock have been scattered, the flock are being devoured, because the shepherds haven't been faithful. It says in verse 8, As I live, declares the Lord, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the wild field for lack of a shepherd. There's no one there protecting them. And my shepherd did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and didn't feed the flock. Again, they didn't do what they're supposed to do. Protect that flock, feed that flock, care for that flock. And so the Lord promises... In verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. You shepherds aren't doing your job. I'll go do the job. I'll reach out for those sheep. Now watch 34, 15, and 16. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. This is prophecy here, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. <clears throat> now again, God is saying here, I will seek the lost. That's a promise of God. He's going to go after these lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now here's something I want you to notice here. In Luke 19.10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Now watch, Ezekiel says, the Lord says, I'm going to seek the lost. The Lord God. And then in Luke, he says, Jesus said, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, has come to seek and save the lost. Jesus is quoting Ezekiel here. And you know what Jesus is saying? I'm God. 
I'm the Lord God. You know, people say if they want to question and argue about the deity of Jesus Christ, it is so pervasive in Scripture. Everywhere you look, it talks about the deity of Christ. He is God. He claims to be God. That's what He's doing right here. I, the Son of Man, came to seek and save the lost. Which God said He would do, and I'm doing it because I'm God. I'm here to regather the flock. I'm here to bind up the brokenhearted. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. Now this flock that these elders are to feed is the church of God. That's the flock, okay? That's the symbolism. It's a church. It belongs to God, this flock. It's His flock. It's not the elders' flock. It's God's, but they have oversight over it. And then He says, which He purchased with His own blood. This is why the elders are to pay attention to this flock. Because it's a special flock. Because He purchased it. The word purchase here is not the common word to buy. That would be Lotruo. In the sense of buying a slave from the market, Latruo is often used to that. This is the Greek word peripeomai, and it means to get for one's own. The force of this word is, I have made these things my own. I made them my own through blood. In other words, the flock was purchased with the blood of his own one. It would be a literal rendering. These sheep were so valuable to God that he purchased them with the precious blood of of his son. That gives you just a little idea about how God feels about his church. And that's why he's telling these elders, listen, you elders have a responsibility. And God loves this church. He purchased it with blood. These sheep were so valuable that he gave his son. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 1:18, knowing that you were not redeemed, and he uses Latruo here for redeem with perishable things like silver or gold from your feet away of inherited from your forefathers, but watch, with the precious blood as a lamb. That's what you were purchased with, the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That's how he bought his flock. You know, when we think of the cross as the divine purpose by which the Son of God, the second person of the eternal Trinity, He came to earth, He took for Himself human nature. And in that human nature, He offered the atoning sacrifice to the Lord God for the people of God. When we think of it in that way, then we have the eternal purpose of God. It is God who is active in the crucifixion, and not man. That's not something man did. It's not some mistake that happened on the planet. It was the purpose of God to redeem man by offering a sacrifice of His very own son that just tells us how valuable we are as the church and he's saying elders this is very very near to the heart of God you be faithful to shepherd this flock Paul tells the Corinthians in 6 19 and 20 do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have of God And that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Again, bringing out this idea, we're bought. Blood bought. Believers, when we get up in the morning, we need to have this consciousness that I'm not my own. It's not about my agenda today. I belong to another. I have been purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am to serve Him this day. And notice that all three members of the Trinity are involved in this verse. The Father purchased the flock. He said, He purchased, that's referring to God. With His own blood, that's referring to the Son. Because God is a spirit, God doesn't have blood. But the Son became the incarnate God-man. He purchased with His blood, and we have the Holy Spirit. So you have the whole Trinity involved here in this idea. All right, that's one verse. Let's move on. I think we'll pick up the pace just a little bit here. All right. (laughs) Paul says, I know that after my departure, Paul's leaving, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. The word savage here (coughs) is a word that sometimes simply means heavy. But most time in the context like this, it means ferocious or fierce. These fierce wolves are going to come in trying to destroy my flock. Now Jesus warned about these wolves 
And in Matthew 7, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, in this text, sheep's clothing is not talking about a wolf with the sheepskin over top of them. All right? You got that picture in your head? Get that out. If this is your picture, get it out of your head, okay? That's a cute little wolf, isn't it? Doesn't that wolf look cute dressed up like that? Or maybe this wolf here looks a little better. Do you know where that image comes from? Anybody know? That comes from Aesop's fable, all right? Where this hungry wolf came upon a sheep's fleece lying on the ground in the field. And the wolf realized that if he wore the fleece, he would look like a sheep from a distance and he could get close to the sheep. Anybody know what happens in the fable? Wolf puts on the sheep's skin, he gets down close to the sheep, fools the shepherd so he gets right in with the sheep. And then you know what happens? The shepherds decide, it's time to eat, let's get a sheep. They grab the wolf and kill it. <laughs> and then realize, well, it's a wolf, it's not even a sheep. So the wolf didn't get too far in the fable, but that's, that's the picture we get. Get that out of your head, okay? That's not what Jesus is talking about. When a shepherd watched over the flocks on the hillside, the shepherd's garment would be a sheep's skin. It'd be worn with the skin out and the fleece inside. So sheep's clothing is not a, a sheep thing stuck over you. The sheepskin mantle became the uniform of the prophet. Just as the Greek philosophers wore the philosopher's robe, it was by that mantle that the prophet was distinguished. He would have this sheepskin mantle on, you know, with the fleece on the inside and the skin out. But sometimes that clothing was worn by those who had no right to wear it. They were not prophets. They were those who wore the prophet's clothing, but they were not prophets. They were false prophets. So it's not like, oh, we're going to know this wolf because he got this stupid sheepskin on. No. He's talking about false prophets who look and dress the part of the prophet, but they're false. And I think Paul was probably talking here about the Judaizers. We knew that they followed him everywhere he went, and they came in and said, it's nice that you've accepted Jesus Christ. That's really good, but you also have to keep the law. False prophets putting bondage on the people of God. It's not enough just to trust you. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the whole law. And they're putting these Gentiles under bondage. They didn't preach the gospel, as Paul says in Galatians. They preached another gospel. A faith works gospel. Which, let me tell you something, people. The majority of preachers are preaching today. A faith works gospel. You have to do this. You have to do that. Most of them are still under the law. Most preachers are preaching the tithe. You got a tithe. And of course they're going to. Their salary is dependent upon that. You know, it's a good idea. Give a tenth. That's not New Testament. That's not the New Covenant at all. We're not under mandatory tithe in the New Testament. What's the New Testament percentage? What is it? It's give as you've been blessed. That's right. You give as much as you want. If you've been blessed a lot, give a lot. If you haven't been blessed much, don't give much. There's no percentage. You give out of your heart. But boy, you don't want to tell people that, well, we don't know how much. It's better just say 10%. That's a good number. Give your 10%. And listen, people, actually the tithe under Israel was 23%. Because there was three tithes. Two that were every year, one that was every third year. So it worked out to 23% they had to do. You know what? That, that's the same as our government's doing to us right now. That's taxation, and that's what the tithe was. The tithe was to run the government. The, Israel was a theocracy. It supported the government. It was free giving was always free will. When God built the tabernacle, he said, "Who's ever of a willing heart, bring in stuff." And what happened? They had to keep begging and begging and begging. No. He had to go and say, "Stop giving. We got way too much stuff here." Well, you're not going to hear a preacher say that in this economy. Uh, you might be waiting a long time. Here, Stop giving, please. we got too much money. Yeah, all right. They keep preaching that tie. All right. Not only are wolves going to come in, and that's bad, but watch what he says in this verse. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. The shocking news was that some of them would prove to be savage wolves. Some of the very elders he was talking to. 
They'd cease to be shepherds who fed and protected the flock, and they'd become wolves preying on the flock, speaking perverse things to their own destructive end. You know, almost every theological school that has ever gone astray has gone astray with a Christian at the helm. Schools, churches, people just depart. Not from without, from within. Same thing happened to Israel. And we have to guard against those who pose as Christians saying you know, some things that sound good so they can get in and be Christian teachers. And I think this is part of the job of a shepherd to warn the flock. How many of you know who Tony Campalo is? Great speaker. He's interesting. But he's a false prophet, I think. Tony Campalo urges the church to overcome its homophobia and work to stop discrimination that denies homosexuals their civil rights. Listen, I'm not homophobic. I'm not afraid of them. There's nothing to be afraid of. But the Bible calls it sodomy. The Bible doesn't call them gay or faggots. It says they're sodomites. And it is... <laughs> yes, I can say that. And it is against the Word of God. And people, it's not us. It's not something that, you know, we're on some kind of crusade. We just want to follow the Scriptures. But we have to understand that it is a sin like any other sin. Like adultery. You know, we have to speak out against adultery as well as that sin. But he's saying, oh man, we've got to accept this. We're homophobic. No, we're not. We're biblical. He said that many Christian homosexuals have been born with that orientation. In other words, it's not their fault. Well, yeah, I, I understand that because I have the same problem. I'm not gay. Hope you understand that. But I have a problem that, you know, men have this propensity to want to cheat. And so I could just say, I was born that way. I was born to cheat. Just in my blood. No. There's a lot of things I was born to do. I was born to get angry at people when they don't agree with me, you know? And so is that right? I could just say it's my nature. Can't help it. I was born angry. No. You got to deal with it. It's a sin. The scriptures condemn homosexuality. It is an abomination to the church. And the Word of God says it's an abomination. We need to stand against it. It doesn't matter what our culture does. And if you watch TV, you know the culture is trying to jam it down our throat. You can't find a show without a sodomite on it. And they're all fake, you know, positively favored, and they're wonderful people. And, and I don't, you know, I know a lot of them, and they're, they are good people in the sense of nice to other people and whatever. But listen, that is something we cannot be brainwashed by to just the fact that we accept that oh, it's no big deal anymore. It is a big deal. It's sin. We've got to speak against false prophets. And Kampalo says some things that, he says some good things. He says some very convicting things. And he's a good speaker, but you've got to watch. Last Friday night, we're supposed to be going to dinner with Stan and Impato, but I wasn't feeling good. So I'd lay down on the bed, and I'm flipping through the TV, and I go to Christian Channel, and my buddy's on there that, uh, what's his name, the Indian guy? Huh? No, not Joel Osteen, the Indian guy who's, huh? No. Come on, the guy, he's, I can't think, I drew a blank now. He's, you know who he is, he's famous, he's got, he always has a little, like, rabbi collar on. Benny Hinn. Okay, Benny's on there, and he's got a bottle of oil, and he's saying, listen, people, if I anoint you with this oil, or I anoint, you send prayer requests, you send stuff in, I'll anoint it with this oil, and for a year, I guarantee you no financial problems. A year guaranteed of financial success from this oil. And I said, Kathy, get in here, look at this guy, selling snake oil. He goes, may God, you know, is my witness. I'm like, God needs to strike that man dead right now. He's promising people. He said, listen, even if you do a stupid financial thing, you'll be protected for 12 months. You can't even screw up financially. In other words, Benny Hinn is saying, you're not going to reap what you sow. Not as long as you got my oil on you. Oh my, and I said, they think I'm crazy. What in the world? Come on, people. And you know, people are following this guy by the masses because he's preaching what people want to hear. Health, wealth, prosperity. So they just follow. We've got to guard against that, people. The shepherd's job is to guard the church of God. 
Whew, let's go on. Uh, therefore, be on the alert. Remember that night and day for a period of three years I didn't cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul said, for three years I preached to you doctrine. I taught you the truth, and I did it with tears. You know, this is not just some, you know, sit back, you know, come to school and take out your notebooks. Paul is passionate about what he's saying because he knows that lives depend on this. And it's important, people, that we take a stand on, on our core doctrines and we're not movable. There's a lot of things we have to have flexibility about. But when it comes to the inspiration and authority of the Scripture, we can't give way there. The triune nature of God, the person and work of Christ, His deity, His sinless humanity. And we have to take a stand on the Gospel. On the radio show, on my Thursday night radio show, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about grace. Sovereign grace, the fact that God gives us salvation, it's a work of God, it's not of man, you don't do anything. People have been getting so upset because I'm just saying it's of God. And people don't like that. Listen, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's our stand. But people feel like they have to act. i got to do something. That's because all the preachers of the land are telling them, well, you gotta do, first of all, you've got to come to church, you've got to tithe, you got to, you know... All these little rules that are not biblical at all is just trying to put people under bondage. And he says, and now I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Paul had most likely led most of these elders to Christ and discipled them for the last three years. Now he says, I'm leaving. I'm leaving you. Can you imagine how he feels? I can understand. I, I was a youth pastor for many years, and I quit being a youth pastor because I killed me every year at graduation. Because I had to take a group of kids that I was in love with, that I was discipling, working with, and say, goodbye, hope you have a good life. And boy, for many years, I didn't graduate kids out. We made them workers, we did, we did something, we hung on to them, because I'm not done with you yet, you're staying here. And pretty soon they start, you've got to let some of those kids graduate, you know. I didn't want to, but it was heart-rendering. That is the main reason I left youth work and wanted into pastoring, because I just, and it was a foolish thing, because people still leave. You know, but, <laughs> and you still have that heartache. You know, you can't get away from it. But, but these, they're heartbroken. Paul's heart broke. What are we going to do? Paul's leaving. So Paul says this. Oh, you know what? I'm going, but I commend you to God. You think they'll be okay? <laughs> if God's taking care of them? You know, when Jacob was dying, he said to his family, I die, but God will be with you. Moses said the same thing. He said, the Lord God said to me, you're not going over the Jordan. He was disobedient. He didn't go over to Jordan. But he says, God will go with you. Look what Moses says. Know therefore today that it is the Lord, your God, who's crossing over before you. God's going with you guys, so it's okay if I'm not going to be there, Moses is saying. And Paul says, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. The word of God had taught them about the grace of God. In verse 24, he had spoken about the gospel of God's grace. And Paul's thinking the word of God was the word of grace. Now let me say, people, we cannot understand Christianity if we do not understand grace. It is the distinguishing Christian doctrine contrary to all works. Grace says salvation is of the Lord. The word grace means free and unmerited favor shown to guilty sinners who deserve only judgment. In fact, the thing that distinguishes Christianity from all other religions is the principle of grace. Because no other system of truth claims to bring men into a relationship with God contains this principle of grace alone as Christianity does. All those systems of thought, all other religions, all other philosophies claim to bring man into a relationship with God grounded on principles of work and human merit. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. Christianity is the purest form, in its purest form, is grounded in the grace of God. And the sad thing is the church has so distorted that. We're still sticking laws on people. Oh, you do that, you're going to go to hell. You do this, you're going to go to hell. My word, where's grace in all this? All of the Christian life is a matter of grace. Listen, we're brought into the eternal kingdom by grace. We're motivated to obedience by grace. We receive strength to live the Christian life by grace. And we receive both temporal and eternal blessings by grace. The whole life is grace. You say, why do we work then? Well, hopefully we work in obedience out of gratitude. 
when we understand what God has done for us, the motivation for holy living is gratitude. Not fear, not condemnation. To live by grace is to live solely by the merit of Jesus Christ. It's to base everything I am, my relationship with God, my acceptance with God, my union with Christ, it is all based on grace. I stand complete because of Jesus. I can't ever say that enough. You're righteous, people. And the, some preachers go, you've got to do this and do this, and you, you look at them and say, I've done it completely, perfectly, 100%. You say, what? In Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ. His righteousness is mine. You can't get more righteous than that. I've obeyed the law totally in Christ Jesus. Nothing to do with obedience other than the obedience of Christ. Paul, in writing to his son Timothy in the faith, says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. It's not about what you do, people. It's God who sought Adam and Eve when they sinned. They hid. God sought them out. It's God who goes after men. And if you thought you sought God first, it's only because you didn't recognize the fact that God had already begun to work in your heart. The work of salvation is unaided on our part. Look at John 6, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Isaiah, in chapter 63, verse 3, speaking of the work of the Messiah, giving the words the Messiah speaks has this to say, I have trodden the wine trough alone. Do you understand that? Alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. Jesus Christ did, provided salvation all by himself. It's a work of God. You know, in a striking testimony to the sinfulness of the human heart, we've attempted to mix human works with divine grace, and thus we destroy the gospel of grace. And one of the main features that this is accomplished through is the doctrine of the free will of man. And almost any church you go to is going to tell you, you got a free will, and God won't violate that. Oh, really? So your will is more important than what God wants, right? And you got this free will, and it's salvation is all about your free will. And that doctrine of free will is almost universally believed in the church today. But the Christian church historically didn't believe that. From Augustine down to the Christian Reformation, free will was an anathema in Christian doctrine. Because it was recognized that the doctrine of free will, the, the man making decision arising from the human heart, unproduced by the Spirit, is a violation of the grace of God. The Roman Catholic Church denies God's grace by mingling it with human works as necessary for justification. Legalism, the same thing, an attempt to either justify or sanctify you by works. Any system of righteousness through human merit denies the grace of God and feeds human pride. It is the Word of God which is able to build you up. That's so encouraging, people. The Bible is alive. It has power to address the deepest needs of your soul and change your life for the better, but you've got to spend time in it. We need to be reading the Bibles, understanding what God has said to us. It's able to build us up. 1017 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. According to Hebrews 11, what is it that pleases God? It's faith. And where does faith come from? It comes from hearing the Word of God. It implies that the Bible will transform your life by strengthening your faith. And so I encourage you, read it. Study it, meditate. Shut off the TV, shut off the games, spend some time with God. As, as Christians, we have got to spend time in the book so we can know the truth and not be deceived by so many voices out there telling us false things. You know, when you look through the New Testament and you read the final parting words of the apostles, you'll discover that all of them turn their audience to focus on the Word of God. We're leaving you. You got the Word. The Word of His grace. It's able to build you up. 
It'll not only build you up, he says it's going to give you an inheritance. And that basically is referring to salvation, the kingdom of God, the new heavens and new earth, all the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's what you get in Christ. You inherit the kingdom and everything in it. He says, I'm going to give it to those who are sanct among those who are sanctified. This is not a special class of believers. All right, all believers in Christ are sanctified by Christ. Sanctified, hagios, means set apart. In other words, when God saves you, He sets you apart for His use. Let me prove that to you. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. Who's the mess, most messed up church on the planet? Who did everything wrong He could possibly do wrong? They go to the Lord's Supper and get drunk. Having sex with relatives. I mean, anything you could... They were just whacked out as bad as you can be. Now watch what... Paul knew this, and he wrote him, and he says, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth. I'm writing to you Christians at Corinth, you bunch of messed up, whacked out, sinning people. You better question, you better look and examine yourself, see if you're even saved. That's not what Paul says. Look what he says. Those who have been sanctified. What? The Corinthians have been sanctified? Saints by calling. Wow, what a way to start a letter to a messed up group of people. Let me tell you who you are. You've been sanctified, you're saints. Now, you might want to clean up your act, because that's who you are. All believers are sanctified in Christ. And Paul says, I have coveted. He goes back to remind them of his example again. He says, I have coveted no one's silver, gold, or clothes. We know this. Paul says, you yourself know that these hands have ministered to my own needs and to men who are with me. Paul said, I didn't come in begging you for an offering. You know, I didn't take up collections. I worked. When Paul got offerings from other churches, they were churches he wasn't at. They were from somewhere he had been. And they took up a collection to send him because they loved him, not because he begged them or asked them for money. We all know that the world is constantly bombed by Christianity begging for money. You know, selling snake oil doing whatever they got to do to beg for money. In fact, I think that's the general impression that much of the world has of the church. They're a bunch of beggars. They, all they want is someone's money. They think of the church as a place where you go and you hear someone talk for a while and then they pass a plate to see how much money they can get. Did you notice we don't pass plates around here? Never have passed a plate. I just feel like if God wants you to give, you know, it's, I, what I love is when visitors come to me and go, what do I do with my offering? I love that. I'm like, well, there's a box in the back back there. How would we know that? I'm like, well, if you want to give, you'll ask, you know. We're not begging for people's money. And you know what? We've never lacked. <clears throat> Look what Paul says about this idea of money very quickly here. And he says, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? I can get married if I want, right? Even as the rest of the apostles and the brother of the Lord and Cephas and Peter's got a wife. Don't we all have that right? He says, or do only Barnabas and I have the right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Think about that. We need you to go fight for the country. Hope you can provide for yourself while you're out there fighting. Wait a second. I'm fighting. I'm on a war front. How am I going to take care of myself and my family? No soldier does that at his own expense. Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat the fruit? You're out there, you got a nice garden going and you don't eat anything from it? No, you're doing it because you want to eat from it. Who tends a flock and doesn't use the milk of the flock? I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. That was a law. They, they weren't allowed to muzzle the ox. If he's threshing, let the ox eat. Now watch this. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? In other words, did God write that just because he cares about these ox? Pay attention to this because this helps us give a hermeneutic on how to interpret Scripture. Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake. What? So when you're reading the Mosaic Law and it says, don't muzzle the ox, that's for our sake. Really? How is that? He says, the plowman ought to plow in hope. And the thresher, the thresher of hope, sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Here's a biblical principle. If someone is teaching you the Word of God, you have an obligation to support that person. That's what Paul says. But Paul says, I'm not taking it. I don't want to take your money. I want to work with my own hands so you, know, you can't accuse me of anything. But that's, God laid that out. 
If that's a person's job, feeding the flock, tending the flock, you ought to be able to live by the flock. And I find that, you know, as, as we have the internet, you know, the website and podcasts and videos, people send us checks all the time. And it's absolutely amazing. Unsolicited. They just, they understand this principle. They're being fed by us, so they support us. That's the biblical principle. Paul says, I have a right to be paid for my labor, but I'm not taking it. He says, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Again, Paul is appealing to his example. He said, I showed you. And now he says it's more blessed to give. He said, the Lord said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Where did the Lord say that? Anybody know? What? This is what's called agrapha. It's part of the agrapha, which means grapha is writings. Agrapha, not writings. In other words, it's not written. It's something that Jesus spoke that wasn't written down, but they heard and they knew and they passed it on. And you say, well, you mean Jesus said stuff and it didn't get written down? Yeah, the Bible says that. Remember what Lazarus wrote in John uh, 21? He says, and, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world couldn't contain the books. There's a lot of stuff Jesus did and said. Paul said that Jesus said this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It got passed down. He knew it. The whole life of the Lord was lived like this. Paul's saying one thing you have to remember in all your ministry you're going to have to look at it as giving. Remember, he's talking to the elders. Take care of the flock. And he said, look at it as giving. It's not about what you get out of that flock. It's about what you give to it. Some shepherds care more about the wool than they do the sheep. Some shepherds fleece the sheep instead of feeding the sheep. And I think that's the whole motivation of the health, wealth, gospel. You know, these guys are living high on the hog. I mean, they are rich, unbelievable, private jets, all kinds of cars, fancy stuff, you know, and they're saying, if you give, you'll get what I have. And so the people are pouring their money, and I want to get that too. The fools, they're just providing for him is all they're doing. Fleecing the sheep. Shepherds have to be more concerned about what they can give their flock than concerned with what they can get from them. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. It's kind of interesting, you know, that wasn't the Jewish policy. Jewish men would stand and pray, but here Paul falls to his knees with these elders. And I can see him there on the beach. They're all just kind of gathered together, praying. He probably prayed that God would keep them from false teachers because he, that's what he's telling them. He probably prayed that each one of them would be a godly example to the flock and that through them the church would be built up and expand all over Asia. He's praying. And watch what the next verses say. And they began to weep aloud. Here's these grown men crying out loud, repeatedly kissing him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. Man, this is a, a heart-touching scene here. They just fall on the neck of Paul and and Middle Eastern men that still do this to the day and greeting one another. They're kissing Paul and they're crying because they don't think they're going to ever see him again. He's leaving them. As far as they knew, it was for the last time. What we see here is the heart of the apostle toward these saints and we see their deep love and affection for him. He has exhorted them, he's encouraged them, and now they're, they're praying together as they part. Now listen, please listen to this. The man who once brought tears to the eyes of the saints by his persecution now brought tears to the eyes of the saints because of his coming persecution. This was the man who was ravaging the church of God, killing Christians, torturing Christians, and now these Christians are huddled together, kissing, praying for this man who's become such a dominant force because he's given his life to God. Paul was a dominant force because he saw himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about his necessities, what he needed, what he wanted. It was about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we saw, he was willing to die if that's what it was about because it was about God's will and not his. Let's pray.